Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Mark Carney. Mark served as the governor of the Bank of Canada from 2008 until 2013 and as the governor of the Bank of England from 2013 to 2020. Mark also was the chairman of the Financial Stability Board from 2011 to 2018. Mark is currently the vice chairman and head of impact investing at Brookfield Asset Management, as well as a UN special envoy for climate action and finance. Mark joins us today to discuss his new book, Values, Building a Better World for All, as well as his career in central banking. Mark, welcome to the show. David, thanks very much for having me. It's a real honor for me to have you on the show. I've been following you for many years. I followed you all the way back at the Bank of Canada, the Bank of England. And as listeners of the show know, I'm a big fan of nominal GDP targeting. So at some point in this conversation, I want to talk about that. But before we do that, and we get into your book and some of your experience in central banking, tell us, how did you get into this career path? What put you on this storied career path that you've had? Well, um, I mean, of course, the reality with uh, almost all our careers is, is a heavy element of luck. And I do remind myself of that. I did when I became governor of the Bank of England, that it was a, a series of uh, fortunate events or unfortunate events, to, uh, depending on your, <laughs> your perspective. <laughs> but I, I started studying economics. I was attracted to economics because of the mixture of, of course, the discipline of, of the market and the rigor of the discipline. I like mathematics. But I like the blend of history, of human psychology, of uh, of the political economy, and those aspects. And you know, what's interesting is that as I went through my studies, like many of those uh, you know who who are listening to this, it gets distilled over time more and more. And certainly, at the time when I was taking economics undergrad and certainly graduate economics, it was the high time of game theory rational models, uh, tractable models, and certain approaches to the world that fit together in a beautiful mathematical whole, but arguably didn't really represent how things uh, work. So I had to unlearn some of that over the course of my career. Now, you joined the Bank of Canada in 2008, is that correct? Yes, I became governor in February of 2008, so February 1st, 2008. Yeah, you were there before, to be clear. You, you were there before. But you jumped in right in the middle of the Great Recession. So they threw you into the deep end of the pool, sink or swim. So that must have been quite an experience to have to become a central bank governor right in the middle of the Great Recession. It was, uh, it was yes, it was an interesting experience, uh, to say the least. More interesting in hindsight. It was slightly terrifying at times. <laughs> but uh, we had one advantage in Canada, which is that in the summer of 2007, and I talk a bit about it in the book, the asset back commercial paper market in Canada froze up. And it's a sleepy corner of the global money markets, global capital markets. But it froze up because it was the canary in the coal mine for a superstructure known as SIVs, monoline, which includes SIVs, monoline insurance, CDO squares. And we realized very quickly that this sleepy little corner in Canada of about $20 billion Canadian of commercial paper was supporting credit risks and a credit architecture of well over 200 billion in London, particularly. And our sense was, wow, if this is going on here, just imagine the scale of the leverage in the major financial centers, uh, which unfortunately turned out to be true. So I would say that while I you know, didn't have perfect foresight of what exactly was going to happen when, we did have a pretty good idea that this was not going to end well. So one of the innovations you undertook at the Bank of Canada during this time is you went from your symmetric corridor system to temporarily to a floor system as the balance sheet expanded. And then I believe 2010 or so, you went back to a corridor system. And the Bank of Canada was one of the few central banks to do this. They expanded their balance sheet when you hit the lower bound, which made sense. And it's almost like textbook perfect. How is it that the Bank of Canada was the only central bank to expand its balance sheet and then shrink it again and go back to a corridor system after the crisis? Well, it's a combination of uh, economics and institutional structure. So the underlying economics meant that we needed to get to the zero lower bound. We needed to provide liquidity to the financial system, even in Canada, because of the global tensions. But we also felt that we could substitute duration for quantity, by which we translate that into that's where forward guidance came in. So providing time contingent for forward guidance, 
It sounds very archaic when I say it now, but that's what it was at the time. It was innovative back in 2008. Time contingent forward guidance provided that extra stimulus. Now, and the reason why I alert to the underlying economics is, of course, what happened as we went from late 2008 into 2009 is there was a global commodities boom, in part because of the big Chinese expansion. And Canada got some of the real and nominal, very importantly, nominal benefit of that, which flowed through the economy. So we didn't have to engage in large scale quantitative easing. We didn't have to take the shadow rate deeply negative. And we were we were fortunate in that respect, but uh, we used the tools that we had in the way you described. Well, that's interesting. It reminds me of Australia as well. They also benefited from that boom. So both of those countries did relatively well compared to the US and Europe during this period. Now, something else that I find fascinating about the Bank of Canada is the review process there. And my understanding is it's been going on for a long, long time. Is that correct? That's correct. We adopted, uh, the bank adopted inflation targeting in the early 1990s. And as part of that, there was a five-year review instituted. So between the bank and the Department of Finance, as the Treasury is called in Canada, go through a review process. Ultimately, it's the minister's decision in terms of what the specific inflation target is or the inflation framework is. That's how it's grounded within the Bank of Canada Act. David, I'll I'll say when it was first put in place, Governor John Crow was the governor at the time. We started with a 2% inflation target. The expectation was that these reviews would lead to a 1% and maybe a 0% you know, uh, actual price stability. That never came to pass. The learning was the advantages of the the 2% target. Tremendous amount of analysis and review of different options, some tweaks here or there, but the system hasn't changed that much even though there have been a large number of these reviews over time. So when you do the reviews at the Bank of Canada, is everything on the table, the target, the tools, as well as the operating system? Target, tools, operating system, yes. Although operating system really, you know, left with the central bank, the plumbing left with us. Certainly the target. And over the years, we've looked at uh, things, including nominal GDP targeting, get you excited yes. there, nominal inflation targeting, average inflation targeting as examples. Uh, after I left, when I was at the Bank of England, the, the Bank of Canada looked at raising the inflation target to try to get additional stimulus there. The one thing that's not on the table is the interaction between monetary policy, supervisory policy, and macro prudential policy, because the Bank of Canada is largely a monetary institute, to use the English phrase. It does have a financial stability analytic responsibility, and it oversees the payment system, but it doesn't supervise banks, unlike the Federal Reserve System or uh, the Bank of England, and it doesn't have any explicit macroprudential responsibilities. So what's missing from the Canadian system, in my judgment, are those interactions between monetary policy and the financial system, or at least uh, the explicit aspects of that. Would that be a decision for Parliament or the finance ministry to make? It would have to be. Yeah, it would be a parliamentary okay. decision. And, you know, I'm making an observation as opposed to a criticism. As you well know, there's path dependence in these arrangements. It has worked well to have a separate bank supervisor. It's called OSPI in Canada. And actually, the thing that concerns me, I'm happy to say this, is that the macro prudential responsibility is less clearly specified in Canada. So for example, you're well familiar, you have the FSOC in the US chaired by a secretary of the treasury, which is a way of, I don't think they use the term macro prudential as formally, but it is a way to look at those cross cutting issues. In the UK, that macro prudential responsibility is housed in the Bank of England uh, explicitly. In Canada, it's ultimately the minister's responsibility, minister of finance, his responsibility. But there's not a formal committee. There's not a formal structure. There's not formal uh, parliamentary remits that are applied. Uh, And uh, to my way of thinking, that's uh, that's an element of the system that could be improved. Well, two more observations about Canada, and we'll move on to the Bank of England. Um, But something that I, I learned over the past few years when the Fed was having problems with its plumbing, so the repo crisis in late 2019, September 2019, and then, of course, March last year, is that the Bank of Canada automatically buys a certain small percent of the public debt that's issued in a given period. Is that right? That's correct, yes. Yeah. So that facilitates you know, smooth functioning of, of debt markets and such. And it's something the, the Fed used to be able to do in, in a small amount, but can't anymore. And some have suggested it would have made you know, some of these, these hiccups easier to handle. 
Uh, yeah, although, I mean, possibly, although my only counter to that is if you're buying a small amount anyways, it just means the issue size is slightly smaller. And so the, the challenge, is, okay. yeah, you would, you know, the question is, I'm sure, in fact, you've gone through some of the plumbing aspects of the uh, the dash, so-called dash for cash, uh, which is a very polite way of describing what happened last spring. <laughs> it's fascinating. No, it's yeah, fascinating. It's, yeah. uh, and so I don't think that the um, just being a bid, a small bid in the market would have made a difference there. And of course, uh, the Fed had to take quite extraordinary steps in order to uh, to stabilize it. Now, you, you say the dash for cash. It really was a dash for cash, which is something, you know, that as an academic, you, you tend to forget, you, you think of like the fiscal theory, the price level where you say, look, short-term T-bills and, and reserves are, are, you know, they're perfect substitutes. But in March, they weren't. People were literally dashing for reserves, for, for, for cash. And uh, it was a striking moment. People wanted the unit of account, the, the, the final settlement balance. But one last observation about Canada before we move on is the incredible stability of the banking system there. So, you know, you, you guys have had a history, I mean, going back a long time, and I know part of it is an oligopolistic banking system. It's more concentrated, but you got branch banking. And my understanding is you didn't have one bank shut down during the Great Depression, where in the U.S. we had like 9,000. And it's been a periodic problem in the U.S. So we don't have time to get into it today, but I, I just look up at Canada and I see this amazing system and wonder what could we learn from that here in the U S I'd say very quickly, two things that stuck out in the crisis. One was, and I mentioned it in the book, not about the banking system per se, but just in general, uh, you know, in finance, if something doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense. Make sure you understand it. It can be explained to you. And if, you know, if I'm explaining something to you, uh, come back to me, if it doesn't make sense, if I can't explain it the second time around, I probably don't know what I'm talking about or, the, you know the, the the product or the or the trend or whatever uh, doesn't hold together. Second thing, it's an, it's been observed many times. The leverage ratio um, that protects you against risks you think are low but in fact aren't. We had a, a quite well specified leverage ratio going into the crisis, and that that saved the banks from uh, subprime. Full full stop. All right. Well, let's move to the Bank of England, and you begin your journey there in 2013. And during this this transition period, I believe you gave a hearing or you gave testimony to um, finance ministers, to parliament, I forget exactly who, but in that that hearing, you talked about nominal GDP targeting. So I, I want to just drill down on this. What do you find appealing? Because my understanding was you actually were supportive of that idea. What do you find that you like about nominal GDP targeting? I think what the first thing is, is a bit of context, which is that the UK had had a very difficult post-crisis period, um, was well below um, post-crisis levels of output, nominal output uh, at that time. Uh, so five years after the crisis um, and was, uh, had been quantitative easing was the effect what then was thought as the effect of lower bounds. The question was, how could we provide additional stimulus to the uh, to the economy? So that that's uh, in part of the context. Second piece of context, you touched on it earlier, David. We had looked at nominal GDP targeting or variants of nominal GDP targeting when I was at the Bank of Canada and could see, in theory, very important point, in theory, um, the power of uh, nominal GDP targeting, uh, the effect on agents, the way you can provide additional stimulus and provide um, uh, that anchoring of expectations that um, can become uh, self-fulfilling. So we, there, there were obvious attractions there. Third point of context is that the inflation target had become more narrowly specified uh, in practice so that the uh, sweet spot of monetary policy returning inflation to target in 18 or 24 months. Um, and you can certainly envision certain circumstances both from below and from above where you would want to take longer in order to bring inflation back to target. So when I was arriving there, inflation was above target, uh, in part because of exchange rate weakness is very high pass through there. And the issue was, uh, you know, would you really tighten interest rates for those purposes as opposed to support uh, the growth of the economy? And, and so there are a variety of reasons why nominal GDP targeting had attractions. Now, the challenge in the UK, one very basic challenge, you would have heard this in your discussions previously, uh, but in the UK is the statistics are um, 
I don't want to say they're unreliable, but they're variable and they get substantially, substantially revised, including on a nominal basis. Uh, so there's not a canceling out of the real versus nominal, not a reapportioning. And so you could be targeting something that changes dramatically. And in fact, just before I arrived, uh, the UK was on the cusp. They narrowly missed it on the measured numbers of a triple dip recession. Uh, so three recessions in near succession. As it turns out, uh, with subsequent revisions, two of those dips never happened. Um, and uh, the nominal path, it was big enough to make a material difference to the stance of monetary policy. Last point, if I may, what we did in lieu of moving to nominal GDP target, there was a reasonably healthy debate about it which is what we wanted, uh, was the remit, is the way the UK talks about the mandate, that the equivalent of that five-year in Canada, the Chancellor sends a letter to the Bank of England governor, the committee, and says, this is how we interpret that inflation target or the inflation targeting framework. And what uh, George Osborne, who was Chancellor then, did, his letter said, don't forget about the flexibility and flexible inflation targeting. Don't forget that you can stretch out the time over which you return to target from above or below. And that turned out to be, it's not nominal GDP targeting, but it moves you along the continuum towards that. And it's also, last point, is incredibly important because one thing that is a bit missed is that throughout the post-Great Recession or post-financial crisis period, the Fed and the ECB they're all in divine coincidence territory. So in other words, inflation is below target and, and there's an output gap. And so both of those aspects push in the same direction for looser policy, whereas Bank of England quite frequently had inflation above target because of exchange rate pass through and a big output gap. And so we needed to have a trade off. And when you get into trade off territory, that's where you need that flexibility. Uh, and, um, you know, that's going to sound pretty familiar. That's <laughs> that challenge is going to sound pretty familiar to people uh, pretty right. around the world. Well, I think it's interesting when you look at the UK's nominal GDP. So outside of, you know, the, the uh, Great Recession and then the pandemic, it was a relatively stable growth path. I mean, effectively, what you saw was an outcome like nominal GDP targeting. So I know last year there was some discussion about it um, in the finance ministry again, and you know, I, I, so I was looking at that time and it, it struck me, it, it wouldn't be that hard of a transition. I mean, there's these practical issues you raised, data revisions and other things, but it, effectively it looked like the UK was doing something like the outcome at least was like nominal GDP targeting already. I, I think that's right. But when you get towards the effective lower bound, of course, it gives you additional stimulus. And as you well know, David, um, that's part of the logic with uh, average inflation targeting. It's not nominal GDP, but it's part of the logic. Um, average GDP targeting, again, harken back to my Bank Canada days. If I compare price level targeting, so not nominal GDP, but price level targeting, average inflation targeting will get me about 80% of what a price level target would do. In a, and particularly in a way that uh, perhaps is more understandable, although people can debate that, uh, than talking about inflation with a drift, um, as opposed to anchoring a target and doing some element of makeup, which of course is what the, the Fed is attempting. Well, I think nominal GDP targeting is a mouthful, not the best marketing <laughs> uh, phrase. But, but I do think that the other way of framing it, an income, a nominal income target, like it used to be called back in the 80s, Bennett McCollum, and those people were discussing it. And I, and I think, you know, I, I support and I'm excited to see the Fed's average inflation target because it does have elements of makeup in it. But I also realize it's a hard sell. You got to tell the public, we want to have higher inflation. And it's temporary. Whereas if you had a nominal income target, you could say, hey, we want to get your incomes back to where they were pre-crisis. We want to get your sales back to where they were pre-crisis. And for me, that seems like an easier sell than saying, hey, we want to get inflation up, which is a symptom of getting income and, and sales back to their pre-crisis trend. Can, can I make one other point? Because I know this is an area yeah. of enthusiasm for you. So one of the things with price level targeting, just make a quick point on that, which is that if you had price level targeting, with no drift. So you, you targeted a flat price level. So very easy to communicate, you know, all prices on average are not going to increase. Of course, you have, there's issues with lower bound, et cetera. But what that would tell people was that anytime you saw inflation in a price, that you would judge that price against a change in quality or the, you know, is, is the product really worth something more if its price has gone up? That's the first point. Second point, the analog in nominal GDP targeting, or as you reframe it rightly, nominal income targeting, is then I look at my wage and my income. 
and I make a judgment, am I getting ahead or not in relative terms, right? You know, where, do, where do I show relative to nominal drift? And, um, you know, we're not in a world of wage price spirals um, and, uh, and, and there's information and from a labor market functioning, uh, there are some attractions uh, there. So we'll see. We'll see. We'll see how average inflation targeting goes. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to eat up all our time. I want to get into your book. But just one more question, since you are a prominent former central banker, you mentioned the data problem, right? There's data revisions, and, and I have my own ideas how to get around it. But but one comment that's been raised about that issue is if a central bank were to adopt a nominal GDP target, and hopefully it would be a level target, then the data would become endogenous to that target. In other words, if the Fed were to adopt such a target, it would put researchers to work to you know, get real spending transactions from online or some other way. If you build it, they will come kind of idea. Do you think that's fair or am I being overly optimistic? I think the distinction, of course, is between, I mean, the Fed is not responsible for the national accounts. So it's, right. yeah, so we need, will it incentivize those who compile them uh, to do even better? Always be nice to statisticians to do even better, but it's tough work. The, pro- the challenge is it's tough work and revisions. Sometimes you need to you need all the information in order. A- absolutely. But I know you've had people at the Bank of England working on this. I know at the Fed, people who are doing real-time data collection, which I know there's are, there's all kinds of problems with that, but you could really put that to use. But let's move on because I do want to get to your book. I, I do want to ask about your, your view of the future of central banking. So we mentioned the Fed's average inflation target. And, and for me, I view this as an historic moment. This is the first time a modern central bank has adopted a version of price level targeting, a watered down version, but it's never been done before. I mean, the only bank, other central bank I know is the Reichsbank back in the 1930s did a price level target explicitly. And it's new, right? It's it's something that hasn't been seen before. So I think some of the consternation we're seeing in the US about this is it's it's new. People have a hard time handling inflation running a little bit hotter than the normal. So I think we're going through the growing pains. We're all kind of groping in the dark trying to figure this out. But my question to you is this. Let's, let's say the Fed is successful, it builds up credibility, and it does effectively have a form of price level targeting against watered down. Do you think this could be the beginning of a, of a sea change where all modern central banks or advanced economy central banks do this? In other words, could, this, could the 2020s be what the 1990s were for just regular inflation targeting, but now for price level targeting? Possibly. As you know, it's fairly restricted, at least at this stage, in that it is, um, I'll call it Bernanke-style uh, average inflation targeting. In other words, it's a tool um, when you're at the effective lower bound that enhances, you know, it, it, rather than, you know, quadrupling quantitative easing, you, you flip to average inflation targeting, you get the benefit of the expectations um, that build up there. That helps with the stimulus. But it's not a tool for when um, rates are well above the effective or above the effective lower bound uh, and the economy is moving forward. So it, there's a long distance of travel between something that's uh, part of the, I, I don't want to call it an emergency, but uh, toolbox, but the you know distress toolbox that uh, uh, we're, we're operating in uh, for it to be the core framework. But you know, the last point, I do think that, that we will have a period of, in, we're having a period of introspection about monetary policy frameworks and the objectives. Uh, and you saw Oli Wren's comments the other day at the ECB, and you have these reviews in Canada that happen naturally. In fact, it's due later this year at the Canadian one. Uh, the Bank of England's looked, uh, others will be looking, and that's healthy. It, it is healthy to look at these, uh, these frameworks, even if it ends up back in the same place properly having debated it's absolutely essential i would say all right so in your book again the title of it is values building a better world for all and we'll come back to the your your executive summary your tie-in but i want to tie in one chapter in there chapter six talks about money and you bring up central bank digital currency and and cryptocurrencies and i'm just wondering do you see this being a future for central banking are we headed to a path where most advanced economy central banks have central bank digital currency in a word yes for for several reasons one i think that there periodically uh, not that often but periodically there's innovation in money um and you think of banknotes in the seventh century and uh, gradually developing um account based money the bank of amsterdam and uh, you know the dutch financial reforms in the, the revolution in the 1600s um 
fractional reserve banking in the 19th century with endogenous money creation in banks, etc. You get these. And I think we're at another period of time where the nature of the economy and the opportunities that are afforded by uh, developments in cryptography and um, uh, I'll just use the shorthand of broader fintech, create these opportunities. But in all of those other examples, ultimately what happens is the core of the system reasserts itself. And there is the state or the central bank on behalf of the state at the center of the system, whether it's the note issuer or the lender of last resort for fractional reserve banks uh, as as that role develops. Uh, And I think in this case, with the core money, which would be a central bank digital currency, which provides at least the top tier of of the new system. Um, And it's it's a tremendously interesting time, but uh, I, I do think that's where it's headed. There are a huge series of questions uh, that have to be answered in order to go from that statement to uh, actual implementation. But uh, it, I, I would suggest that it's occupying a, a considerable amount of, uh, of, of time within those institutions at present. Yeah, I like what Fed Chair Powell says. We don't need to be the first one out the gate. Just make sure we do it right when we do bring it on board. You are well known for your, I guess it's 2019 Jackson Hole speech you gave. In fact, I was there. I was in that little room when you talked about the synthetic hegemonic currency. And I was like, wow, it's a pretty bold uh, call there. And um, maybe you can summarize your SHC. It's, it's pretty, you know, it's like synthetic upon synthetic central bank digital currency. But maybe you could explain it to our listeners and just tell us what's been the reception to the idea. Well, I was I was making a couple of points. One, I was, uh, as I said, I was paying it forward from Ben Bernanke because Ben Bernanke's last speech to central bankers uh, when he was chair of the Fed said, you know, I've, I've dealt with a lot of things, which was true. He was very modest about his accomplishments. But he said, the one thing I can't figure out is what to do about the international monetary system because it's got this fundamental problem at the heart. And there is, you know, spade is spade. There is a huge asymmetry at the heart of the international monetary system with Dollar dominance and the multipolar economy, lots of issues around that. Um, and I'm not saying it's about to change overnight, but that's one fact. Um, the second fact, and, and by the way, that breeds instability in emerging economies and makes, uh, you know, makes the global economy more challenged. Uh, the second fact was at the time, there was a uh, hegemonic currency being proposed by stealth, which was Libra, which was a stable coin, uh, which is a form for those who don't follow closely of cryptocurrency, but was going to be based on a basket of the major currencies. Okay. And so the point, and the point I was making was now when you, you have conditions eventually for a shift in reserve currency, because you, we have this dysfunctional structure that's only growing at the heart of the monetary system. Second point, when there's a change in reserve currency, it's driven by means of payment. So what happened when we went from pound sterling to dollar is more and more people in the late 19th century, 20, early 20th century, paid for commodities and goods in dollars instead of sterling. And it's that, that pricing in dollars, that means of payment, use of dollars, that drives the financial ar- architecture that builds off of it. Now, my point was that, okay, we have this huge growth, obviously, in digital, which has only accelerated since that speech. And if the unit of account, the means of payment, is Libra, which is the basket of currencies, that has some potential to start to displace and start this restructuring. And the point, which was just to finish the logic, and if people are still with me, I congratulate them, which is, oh, this is good stuff. Say, we want to move towards a more of a multipolar system because it'll be better for the global economy. And so we should own the currencies, we, the central bank, should own the currencies that are at the heart of digital payments. In other words, we should have central bank digital currencies. That was the heart of what I was saying. And if we did that, there's ways to knit them together in this synthetic way that would help. We could kill two birds with one stone. It was a very ambitious speech, I would say, David, for a lunchtime audience at Jackson Hole, when all everyone really wanted to do was to go hiking. Well, actually, I had a conversation with some people about that speech during the hike, so it, it definitely got us thinking. But I mean, what has been the reception? I mean, I let me present my the biggest barrier I see to that being implemented, and that is just, the, as you said, dollar dominance, the scale of the dollar assets out there. So I've had some previous guests on the show, and we've talked about magnitudes. If you look at 
all the dollar assets we've exported from the U.S. to the world. If you look at all the, the BIS, you know they collect data on dollar assets, and liabilities being created outside the U.S. You're getting thirty trillion. I mean, depending on what you what you want to measure, you can, you can get thirty trillion plus in dollar denominated assets, and you'd have to compete against something that big. And so it would it'd be a big scale. Would it not require the SHC to scale up to something that size, or to at least a meaningful portion of that to make it competitive? You know, to be absolutely clear, what the core of what I was drawing attention to was we have a big problem in the system. Yeah. And we still do. Uh, second point. Secondly, don't let Libra become the core of the system. We should own the core of the system. We should have central bank digital currencies. And in that regard, was part of a broader campaign to launch central banks, to work on central bank digital currencies. Uh, within a few months, Christine Lagarde and I formed a group, a core group of central banks. The Fed subsequently joined that group. So there's a, that's why there is the big group, or that's one of the contributing factors to that. In terms of regime switching in, um, in reserve currencies, it happens very rarely. But it does happen. Um, and it ultimately is driven by the underlying economics. And I'm not clear when it will. I do think, though, that last point, which is that, and this goes back to uh, whether you have a central bank digital currency, if you're the Bank of England, Bank of Canada, some other uh, currency, what you don't want is that the only digital means of payment for a smart contract for a, a digital online is, is, is dollar-based, because all that's going to do is reinforce dollar dominance. Yeah. So your point is, if, if I can summarize, is the SHC is kind of like the tail end of a broader argument, broader point. It's a tail end. It's, it was the logical conclusion of a broader argument. But David, I was perfectly happy to accept that central banks would have central bank digital currencies and displace Libra slash DM. Sorry, uh, those advocates of that. Um, and uh, it seems we're at least headed in that direction. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Okay. Let's, let's move to your book. We've been touching on areas in your book, as you've mentioned. Um, but let's let's talk about your book again. The name is Values: Building a Better World for All. Why don't you give us kind of the, you know the executive summary of it, and we'll delve into some of the the topics you cover. So part of it we touched on a bit of it in in when you asked me about my uh, career in economics, which is uh, this sort of drift in terms. The, the book looks back at the history of how value is seen and the rise of what's called the subjective revolution, uh, where you combine that with um, with marginalism so that the price price becomes value. Value is in the eye of the beholder um, and taken to an extreme. If something doesn't have a price, it doesn't have value. And it goes through the experience of that uh, and then brings that towards how markets function and then how we can use certain markets uh, to achieve societal values. In, in essence, what it's doing is reuniting the two halves of Adam Smith, invisible hand of uh, wealth of nation and moral sentiments, and, and, and the social construct of the market in moral uh, sentiments. And we talked about, I'll give you, I'll give you two extremes of it. Uh, we talked about the example of what happened with uh, the financial crisis and the build up to the financial crisis. And in the run up to the financial crisis there, and I was part of this very strong belief in markets and the solution um, if there was market failure was often to build new markets. It was a, a sort of arrow de bruh type approach that this is just an absence of completion of markets. So we can, if we complete markets, we'll be okay. And that's part of the way you end up with CDO squares, by the way, uh, markets on markets on markets. Um, well, that doesn't fully work as we saw. That's one extreme. Um, and also in that process, some of the underlying values, the moral sentiments, to use Adam Smith's terminology, that underpin markets, certain values that underpin effective market uh, functioning, were undercut uh, through behavior and other aspects. So that's where value undercuts values. The other end of the extreme is what I'm arguing is beginning to happen with climate and sustainability where more and more weight is being put on, okay, let's deal with climate change. Let's move towards a net zero economy over time. Um, and that is the objective. That's the societal objective. Let's have sustainability. Well, in that world, once it becomes obvious that that is a hierarchical value, then markets organize themselves to deliver that, to deliver that solution. And tremendous value, financial value, commercial value is created in the process. And I'd argue, uh, you know, and I'm feeling I'm feeling reasonably confident about this, just uh, having been part of uh, an effort that signed up 70 trillion dollars 
of uh, financial institutions uh, for net zero by 2050s, uh, which was announced with the Biden summit, that the core of the financial system is moving in that direction. So that relationship, and I'll finish on this, between value and values can go both ways. Um, value markets in service of societal values, that's the best of all worlds. Or if we get the values component of it wrong, if we take it for granted, it can actually undercut uh, the functioning of of the market, uh, as we saw in the in the financial crisis. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. I, I was thinking about this as I read your book, and I've I've heard several other discussions by free market people like myself who love capitalism and all the good that it's done. But does capitalism by itself begin to erode values? It, you know, I mean, it, it like you said, the theory of moral sentiments complements the wealth of nations. Is, is there a tendency? Do you think? for capitalism to lead to some kind of amoral direction or push, or is it it's just the underlying culture or anything else? I think it's, um, I mean, the answer, it doesn't necessarily have to, I'm a huge fan of markets. I've been in and around both sides, all sides of markets, really, uh, my entire career. Uh, and, you know, it's the most powerful instrument we've, we've ever invented. Um, but it does require some regulations, uh, some market infrastructure, and certain values that are consistent uh, consistent with markets fulfilling their role over time. And you know, we all know, and certainly those of us who are involved in financial markets, that uh, they are prone to excesses of exuberance and despair. It's not the rational expectation. You know, everyone's not rational. There are human frailties. There are market uh, market shortcomings. They interact in a way. Uh, that can undercut uh, the effectiveness of markets. And the question is, what do you do about it? How much of that is through regulation? How much of that is through reinforcing uh, the right values around markets? And and the book goes through a number of examples where where that's the case. You just mentioned financial markets and the excesses that can emerge there from time to time. And you mentioned you know the financial crisis or the Great Recession, 2007, 2009. And you also have the perspective of being at two central banks and the chairman of the Financial Stability Board. So when you look back at the crisis in that period, the Eurozone crisis, what we're going through, what do you see as the key issues in our financial system? Well, I think the you know the first is, and, and this is uh, born directly from Hyman Minsky and uh, Rogoff and Reinhardt, of, uh, I, I talk about in the book, the, the three lies of finance. And the first is this time it's different. Uh, something fundamentally positive happens. Um, uh, it leads to new paradigm thinking. There's uh, lots of good that comes from that, but it can be taken to extremes. Um, and then leverage is built upon that in the Minsky moment that comes from that. And we've seen that uh, time and time uh, again. I think the second thing and related to this, and this is uh, probably the toughest challenge uh, for the policymaker and certainly a policymaker who believes in markets is one's tendency either to think markets are always right or to think that markets will always clear. You get sucked into with, you know, liquidity illusion in markets. And so the expectation is they will find their price and sustain their price. Well, there are a number of examples where that doesn't happen. Uh, we talked about one a few minutes ago with the, I mean, the most liquid market in the world, the US Treasury market, because of market structure, combination of that and panic, which sets in when assumptions are disabused. Um, and then the last aspect uh, is around the morality of markets. And to be clear, as I say, big believer in markets, but this presumption of the values that underpin it. So are people acting responsibly fairness? Do you do institutions have a sense of uh, uh, some sense of the system and, and their end clients? And how do you reinforce that? When we looked at, you know, the financial reforms, we had very specific things to do, fix problems in the shadow banking sector. The banks, you know, one aspect, banks didn't have enough capital. Second aspect, um, change the structure of derivative markets. Third aspect, um, but we recognized that um, we needed to instill and a degree of responsibility in senior managers for their institution and for the system uh, as well. And uh, and different jurisdictions did that to varying degrees. Uh, the UK is very strongly in place uh, in terms of both the compensation structure and the expectations as a supervisor of those senior managers. So, you know, in the end, the last thing I'll say is the challenge is that the half-life of memory in financial markets is very short mm. uh, and people forget, people turn over and forget. And so as a policymaker for the central bankers uh, listening, um, you know, one of our jobs is to plan for failure. 
don't think about why the bad thing isn't going to happen. Think about what you wish you would have done once it happens and do it today. Uh, and so put those buffers in, build that diversity, make sure you have the emergency tools, do that planning today. So when the bad thing happens or something similar to it that you don't expect, uh, you're ready. One more question about financial regulation and we'll move on. I like having you here to draw upon your experience. Um, one of the concerns that many of my guests have expressed before, and, and many have written about this, is th this dollar dominance, the global shadow banking system. So even if we tighten, say, regulation in the U.S. so that we can minimize runs on you know dollar liabilities or, or money-like liabilities, there's all these other firms overseas doing the same thing. And it's, it's kind of a whack-a-mole game. You're trying to get one firm and then go somewhere else and do it. And, you know, as a response, the Fed had to step in last year with its, its swap lines, all of its facilities to keep the dollar funding markets running. And what do we do about that? Or maybe we do nothing at all. I don't know. What are your thoughts about the, the growing dominance and, and, and reach of the global shadow banking system? Well, you know, and this is one of the elements of um, your favorite speech um, at the uh, Jackson Hole. So I commend people to go back and look because... One of the one of the points that I made in that speech, just to reinforce your premise of the question, is that there have been a number of institutional improvements. I'm saying broadly speaking, in major emerging economies, you know, more inflation targeting central banks, and by and large, more capital in the banking system, you know, better fiscal policy. There are exceptions, but by and large, it's been the case. And and there's some uh, analysis of that. Uh, in terms of GDP at risk, uh, that that type of approach. And I think you had somebody on recently who was talking about this. This, you know, and, and there's been some analysis of that, um, which shows that actually it's reduced the tail, the left tail, uh, quite substantially. But what's happened at the same time is greater dollar dominance, and relative to the size of the U.S., which means that you can have monetary policy in the U.S. not uh, in sync with the requirements of the emerging economy. You understand the tension. And the growth of market-based finance or shadow banking, including funds that aren't necessarily based in those emerging economies, they're based in the US and the UK and Europe, but they're offering daily liquidity and investing in emerging market debt, which of course is a, uh, under stress is a very uh, unstable um, dynamic. And actually that has largely canceled out the institutional improvements in terms of the net riskiness. So it's a real issue. Now, what do you do, which is the core of your question? Um, and this is true for shadow banking, it's true for banking, cross-border banking, derivative markets, other things, is you try to come up with agreements at the FSB of minimum standards in those areas. Uh, and then you... Um, you can't, it's not a treaty based organization. When people go home, they don't have to implement those agreements. Uh, but you monitor that and uh, you watch and, and, and you're, you're, you're building again this common understanding of the system, the risks that are uh, being derived. You have a sense of ownership because countries have been part of the development of those agreements and then they've been implemented. I will say, David, that when my time at the FSB and at just up until when I left as uh, governor of the Bank of England, the toughest area to get those agreements on was in exactly the area you're talking about, which is around, I wouldn't say shadow banking as a whole, but on asset management, uh, daily liquidity funds, investing in uh, increasingly liquid. And that's an example of an area where you hadn't had, and we didn't have until the spring of last year in the U.S. first, that panic on a scale where you had to have large-scale central bank intervention. Because remember what happened in the spring first, or not first, but in parallel to those international swap lines, was the Fed putting in place very large facilities to buy, not provide liquidity against, to buy corporate debt in the, in the core U.S. market. And, and that tells you something that I think tells you something about the market structure. Last point is that what we're seeing is, um, of course, the FSB is taking a look at this in a so-called holistic uh, manner as are, as are uh, the Fed and the SEC in, in, in the U.S. Well, let's move to the climate change issue. And you cover it fairly extensively in your book. And what role do central banks have to play in that? So it depends on the central bank. If you're the Bank of England and you... Uh, don't just do monetary policy, but you oversee the insurance market, including Lloyd's of London, which is one of the biggest catastrophe risk uh, insurers. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, you, you instantly have a supervisory responsibility, make sure they have enough capital against extreme weather events and uh, how those change. Uh, 
if you have macro prudential responsibility, in other words, making sure the system can withstand a systemic risk, and with climate, one of the biggest systemic risks are actually the transition towards a uh, you know, more sustainable economy. If, if, uh, it sounds a bit like a paradox, but the fact is that uh, if that transition is smooth and predictable, then market functions well, certain assets are gradually retired, uh, uh, lower carbon assets come into play and the banks and other financial institutions adjust. If it's, if it's a delayed and quite abrupt transition, then you will end up with stranded assets and large losses at that point. Uh, so the question is how robust are, again, if you're a central bank that oversees uh, a bank or an insurance company, how robust are they to those developments? The other area, though, is uh, which some central banks are looking at is in terms of their monetary policy and liquidity operations. So the ECB is looking at this. The Bank of England is now looking at this. How consistent is the collateral that they take for those operations with either the transition well, with the transition towards net zero. Uh, and if it's not consistent, what do they do about it in a way that is as market neutral as possible? Because as you know, uh, in general, central banks are trying to be market neutral, but in some jurisdictions, it's not uniform. There is this overlay in terms of, uh, in, in terms of climate. So do you envision central banks, for example, buying green bonds or, or using their balance sheet space to support the transition? I think the issue is this, which is um, as a central bank, you need to be able to uh, take collateral against a broad range, whether it's for asset purchase reasons or providing liquidity uh, against collateral. You need, you need a reasonably broad range of collateral. So only to buy green bonds, it's still a relatively small proportion of the market. What you need to be able to do as the central bank, in my judgment, is to provide liquidity or buy assets that are part of the transition. So it's not just green, you're going from brown to olive to you know light green towards towards Kelly green. And you and you need a richer taxonomy around that, which is being developed but doesn't fully exist. And I, that's one of the challenges that needs to be addressed in order for the central bank to be able to fulfill its core responsibilities. And if it's in a circumstance where it has this overlay to do it. And let me just be clear, this is not about a central bank reading into its remit some new responsibility. In the UK, the chancellor has written uh, to the committees, directed the committees for the supervision of the banks, for the macro prudential and the monetary uh, committees, you must take climate change into account. So that that's an explicit direction. So So what they're doing is they're working through exactly how they do that. In the case of the United States, you know, the Fed has a very narrow mandate. Um, do you foresee challenges of for the Fed going down that path? Well, I'm, I'm sure the Fed, as it always does, will stay clearly within its mandate uh, in this regard. And a number of governors have spoken about these issues. Um, the Fed, of course, is the supervisor in the Federal Reserve System, supervisor of some of the world's largest financial institutions and financial institutions across the board. These are real risks. And this transition if it's going to succeed, will proceed relatively rapidly. So as the supervisor, any central bank who is a supervisor, you want to make sure uh, that your firms are have a strategy that's resilient, that they're taking these risks seriously, that it's overseen at the right level of the board, that they n- understand the data and other aspects uh, around those risks. And I, I'm sure the Fed will, um, uh, will play in that regard. It's a different thing, though. It's, that's not saying monetary policy is determined by change because it's a longer term structural. uh, Right. As you mentioned, you just want to have a portfolio of assets that reflects the transitions already going on in the economy toward a greener, cleaner system. Let's switch from the central banks into the finance system more generally. So what concrete steps should we be taking so that it supports this transition? I think the first thing, so we need information, we need tools, we need markets, and we develop all of those. Um, Markets don't function well without the right information. So one of the things we've been doing uh, is getting climate disclosure. So it's robustness, the resilience of its strategy to that transition towards climate and towards physical climate events. For some, it could affect the supply chain. For others, it's the, the competitiveness of their products or services uh, as a price on carbon increases or fuel standards change or uh, the certain regulatory aspects that come into play. That's something called the TCFD, which is the core um, 
uh, really the gold standard for that disclosure. And it, there's a process globally of implementing that type of disclosure so that it's clear, it's comprehensive, it's consistent across jurisdictions, and the market can take a view. People in the market can take a view of who's going to be competitive going forward in this environment and who isn't. And by the way, that view in a market will also uh, be influenced by what people think will happen with climate policy, you know, whether there'll be big infrastructure spending or a price on carbon or, you know, some other regulation, the market will be a market, but it needs, markets need information. This is now a core driver of value and they don't have that information yet. So we need that to be in place. On the other side of the ledger, there are some new markets that need to be, created um, to be of a standard of other markets. So you hear a lot of uh, information or, or headlines around carbon offsets, for example, which, you know, do I plant trees to take carbon out of the air? Uh, do I get a benefit if I have a, uh, re- you know, new renewable in an emerging economy, et cetera? Um, that market is, for all the headlines, is tiny. I mean, it's measured in the hundreds of millions of dollars. In a true transition, this is a $100 billion a year market. Um, and so there's a big process that's underway to put in place the plumbing and the governance, the standards for a global market and carbon offsets, uh, which which we will see uh, move forward um, uh, probably by the end of the year. So that's a pretty exciting development. Third thing, and I'll stop on this, which is for the financial institutions themselves, what's their trajectory? What's their carbon footprint um, of the people they're investing in or lending to? Uh, and how do they expect to manage that uh, going forward? Uh, do they have a, a transition towards net zero? How much sustainable finance at another way are they going to do? And uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, um, you know, we have some of the world's biggest institutions, uh, many of which are headquartered in the United States, who voluntarily uh, stood up and said, uh, you know, we're going to manage to net zero by 2050. Actually, we're going to have specific targets by 2025 and 2030, so you can measure the short term. Um, and um, they don't say this quite as loudly, but what they're also saying and thinking, and we're going to make a lot of money off of this because actually this is the way the world's headed. I mean, I'm not sure exactly where we get there, but to be carbon competitive is, um, is, is going to be value creating. So do you foresee any challenges over you know, what we define as green or the appropriate transition. So what comes to my mind would be like, you know, I, I would think personally we want to include nuclear, geothermal, but there are some who would say no, no, no to that. So do you see any issues on that front? There are issues on, first thing to say on the technology side is we need a host of different technologies in order to truly get to net zero. So it could be nuclear, it could be small modular nuclear reactors, um, certainly geothermal you know, can play a role as does solar, and ultimately, um, for many applications, think about steel and others, you need hydrogen to be able to use hydrogen at scale. So there's a host of technologies, some of which are economic today, solar, wind as two great examples, others which you can see becoming economic by the end of the decade at the latest, probably maybe earlier, which is some of the hydrogen technologies, carbon capture and others, um, and then others which you know may take a little longer but still need to come in. So I think there's a host of technologies. What we need, and this is something we're working on, is to use Carvel's line, is the transition stupid? It's about a transition. It's not about, you know, we can't just jump overnight to the green nirvana um, and there's a series of, you know, it's about making progress, reducing emissions uh, with a series of technologies and investments uh, over time. And uh, and so we need ways, we need disclosure that uh, reveals that. Uh, we need a way of aggregating that and talking about it that fairly represents uh, where we are in this transition. And that's part of what's being developed for Glasgow in uh, in November. Well, Mark, we are nearing the end of the show, and I want to give you the uh, final word here. Any parting thoughts? David, well, first, thank you for having me. It was a great conversation. I hope we get your nominal GDP targeting one day. I think the thing that links uh, our conversation, is helpful to bring it out, is that uh, As we said, we're both big believers in markets uh, and the value that can be created by markets. Markets exist in a in a bigger system. Uh, It's important to have that system right uh, and to deliver what uh, what society values. And part of that, an essential part of that bigger system, is our central banks. Uh, You know, the role of central banks for monetary stability, for financial stability, 
for thinking through the future of money and delivering that future of money in a way that markets can do their job. And of course, markets doing their job is ultimately about providing solutions and a better way of life for, for people. Okay. With that, our time is up. Our guest today has been Mark Carney. His book is Values, Building a Better World for All. Mark, thank you again for coming on the show. Thank you very much for having me, David. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.